Bitcoin Insight is restricted to those with a need to know. When you have a need to know, when you have a crisis, if your country is in crisis, if your company is in crisis, if your family is in crisis, when the bank freezes and fails and the currency crashes and you have a business or you, or you have a life and you're in that culture, you have a need to know, your eyes are open. Now you, now you start to take Bitcoin seriously. Now you adopt Bitcoin. Now let's hear more from Michael Saylor on how the need to know concept is driving Bitcoin's global adoption and its potential to reshape the financial landscape. Trump has discovered Bitcoin. Trump has a need to know. Right, El Salvador, their currency crashed, you know, they had a need to know. I think people in, in countries like Lebanon, right, they don't have a reliable banking system, they have a need to know. Um, in, uh, in places where the society is affluent and the leaders are affluent and they feel comfortable and they don't feel threatened or challenged, if they're comfortable and they're political, um, standing, if they're not afraid of being uh, being driven out of office, they don't have a need to know. If if they're not insecure about their currency, if they're not insecure about their banks, they don't have a need to know. Right? In those cases, they'll be the latest, the last to embrace Bitcoin or to appreciate it because they don't have a need to know. But the world's full of places that where you do have a need to know, and it's not just places, but it's peoples, right? the minority out of power, right, who are disenfranchised, who are disinherited, right? They used to say about America, right? Who, who settled in America? It was the second sons. <laughs> it was the, the, the second sons settled in America. The first son inherited the family estate in Europe, and the second son wasn't going to inherit anything. And so if the second son wanted property, a future, hope, they got on a ship, they crossed the ocean at great peril to themselves because there was an entire continent where they might actually get a start and they might have a chance. The second sons had a need to know. And I think Bitcoin is a great equalizer in that regard. You know, the wealthy, affluent, comfortable won't have a need to know. They will be blind to it. And those who are disenfranchised, who are, uh, you know, who are looking for a better future, they will be, they are the hopeful ones, but they're the, also the seekers, the searchers, right? They're, they're going to look, they're going to find it. They are finding it. Hundreds of millions are finding it. They'll embrace it. They'll benefit from it. The rest of the world over time will discover it when they have a need to know. As we just In a recent interview with Robin Sear, Michael Saylor delves into Bitcoin's transformative potential, emphasizing the importance of understanding its concept. Saylor explains that Bitcoin adoption spreads out of necessity, with individuals and institutions embracing it when they truly need its benefits. He argues that economic crises and financial instability create a need to know that drives Bitcoin adoption. At the time of this discussion, Bitcoin is trading around $60,000, showing a 6% decrease over the past 24 hours and an 11% decrease over the last 7 days. With 19.7 million Bitcoins in circulation out of a total supply of 21 million, Sailor envisions a future where Bitcoin's adoption accelerates as more people recognize their need to understand this revolutionary digital asset. I, I think if you look at uh, economic creatures, the the classic economic creature in modern society is the corporation. The average life expectancy of a corporation is something like 10 years. You create a company and it lasts more than 10 years, then you've lived longer than most. The number of, um, of corporations that are more than 100 years old, mm. right? What percentage of people live to be more than 100? like 0.1% or 0.01%. What percentage of corporations love to be more than 100? 0.0001%. Well, what if I told you I could make your company live forever? Right? It's So how, how profound... We're talking about... We're talking about... Uh, eliminating corporate mortality, right? We're, 
we're talking about stretching economic vitality easily by a factor of 10, maybe by a factor of 100, maybe by a factor of a million. Um, so, you know, how will it change society? Well, it won't change society uniformly the same everywhere. It's like, you know, Gibson says uh, the future is already with us, but it's not evenly distributed, right? In the modern world today, there are people in New York City that live in skyscrapers up 80 floors, and there are people that live in Africa in mud huts, you know? <laughs> And you can find certain peoples that are still stuck in Neolithic Stone Age cultures if you look hard enough. And you can find people that if the electricity was turned off to their elevator, they die, right? And so very, very, very profound difference. I think um, you gotta look at, um, at Bitcoin is this pure digital capital which means it's, it's the technology to capitalize a, a family, capitalize an individual, capitalize a corporation, capitalize an institution, a charity, a nonprofit, or uh, a country or a city so, or, or a university, right? I, you know, we, we throw away the, the word, throw around the word capitalize as a colloquialism, like, oh, you're going to capitalize on that? Okay, but if you think, and, and that's because economics has been pseudoscience and capital, capital has been kind of, a, you know, a liberal arts, arts type word. If you walked up to people on the street and said, what do you think capital is? And you asked them before Satoshi or before then it said Bitcoin. It's not clear what they would give you as an answer. They would, you know, say something about Karl Marx said it was bad or capitalists to do something with it. But it was, it's such a such a fuzzy word. But uh, in the aftermath of Bitcoin, capital is economic energy, and I give you an asset to store economic energy. And and uh, now, if I can store economic energy in a digital asset, I can move the capital potentially at the speed of light at high frequency so I can move it through space, right? Can you actually oscillate capital at 10 megahertz? Mm. You can oscillate, you know, you can, you can create a, a, a 10 megahertz signal, right? 10 kilohertz signal you could probably hear, right? So at certain frequencies when you're, when you're vibrating uh, energy, right? you get a, a result. Capital's never been uh, something we could work with, we could program. So Bitcoin allows you to program and channel capital through time and space. And uh, in time, it, you know, it means that we have the hope of addressing things like global payments for, uh, for 8 billion people at the speed of light off of mobile phones with no intermediary, right? So that, that's interesting. How, how do I actually do 100 transactions a second if I'm an AI bot and I want to trip through cyberspace, right? I mean, that's interesting. You won't do that without digital energy or digital capital. But the other issue is, well, how do you actually send uh, a bunch of capital forward in time 100 years, right? And there's, you can't do it with gold. You can't do it with a building. You can't do it with a share of stock. I mean, name a company that's still in existence from 100 years ago off the top of your head where the stock is worth more today in real terms than it was then. It'd be kind of challenging, right? So, so projecting economic energy through time and space has really been more of, a, of an aspirational fantasy, right? Or an art than it was ever a science or engineering discipline. Bitcoin, uh, it, it takes something from the artistic and from the religious and from, and from the political domain, and it moves it into the engineering domain where now there is actually a precise way to move capital around, to store capital, to capitalize. You know, and I, I guess your question is how will the world change profoundly, right? I mean... 
I can create an AI that can live in cyberspace capitalized by Bitcoin that will live forever, that will have economic mortality that is, uh, that is completely uh, sovereign from a company, a person, a country. That AI could, in theory, split itself, you know, go viral and spawn 10 million more AIs that are all sovereign. Mm -hmm. It's a life form, right? It's right. Uh, I could, uh, and I can endow a, a a university, a nonprofit, a foundation with Bitcoin that could perceive, uh, con uh, conceivably last a thousand years without anybody working for it, right? I can, I can create new types of entities. I can create companies that don't have a life expectancy of 10 years, and I, I can create a company with a likely life expectancy of 100 or 500 or 1,000 years. I can have different missions. I can think differently about how I capitalize or finance my country. I think, think differently about uh, how I build. Every product and service could be different. Right. If you think about products that are around us all all the time, you know, life insurance products or or any kind of annuity products, all of those things, right, will be disrupted. Maybe they'll be dematerialized. Mm. Right. There's a there's an entire industry that shuffles around four hundred trillion dollars of assets. So we have four hundred trillion dollars of twentieth century analog assets that are inefficient, that are toxic that are dilutive, and those are handled by a massive financial establishment that's inefficient, right? And so you have a very inefficient establishment handling inefficient assets, trading them back and forth inefficiently. You could obliterate it all. You could just replace it all with just, I have Bitcoin, I hold it. I don't need the establishment. I, I don't need the bank to hold it. I don't need the Wall Street firm to trade it. I don't need to trade it. I don't need to diversify across, like, why do I buy the S&P 500 index? Why do I have to buy 500 different companies when I know that most of them are not even that good or that successful, but I have an entire entire financial infrastructure to to trade and rebalance inferior assets as a store of value what if you just obliterate it all, mm. right? Maybe it all just goes away. So I think the world changes, but it'll, it'll change in every sector, in every part of the world at a different rate, depending upon politics, depending upon leadership, depending upon culture. And there'll be profoundly beautiful things that'll be created that you could have never created before. There'll be terrifying things that'll be created that no one conceptualized before, and there'll be parts of the world where they do it the same way in 50 years they did it 30 years ago, I suppose.